Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Many times, something happens to us which is uncomfortable, causes us unhappiness, it can injure us, whatever. And what we say is, I never saw it. We might be driving in a car, have an accident, and what do we say? I never saw that car coming. I never saw this event taking place. It surprised me. I was incorrect. I had poor perception. Now, we can understand how poor perception can adversely affect our life in a variety of different areas. But here's the takeaway for you today in this message. When you have poor perception of who God is, how he behaves, what is his nature, what is his purpose, what is his will, when you don't have a right perspective on these things, it will lead to an eternal disaster. It's very important that we have the right perspective for God. And once you receive that right perspective, you know what the scripture says? He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is dependable. We will never be surprised once we know the true God. We're not going to be surprised in how he behaves. The only thing that may surprise us, and it will be a good su surprise, is how loving, caring, merciful, forgiving, how blessed he truly is. And those things, well, they will be a source of joy. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm number nine. Now, this psalm, again, has what we've learned to call an inscription. Many times, it's the first verse in Hebrew. Normally, in other languages, we find that it's a sentence or a statement that appears prior to the first verse. I've said so many times, and I remember this, that it is Scripture. It is not something that someone else wrote, someone else's an opinion, an editor or such. It is the word of God. And notice what this inscription is. It's an instruction, as most of them tend to be, to the leader of worship, the choir director, the chief musician, one that is leading this worship experience through the book of Psalms. We read in verse 1 in the Hebrew to the music director, the choir leader, it says concerning the death of the son. Now, many people interpret this as David writing this psalm, and it may be the case, when he lost his son Absalom or Absalom. That may be factual, but it doesn't say this. It is simply a psalm that is recited at very difficult times. As we see here, the death of one's son. What a tragic experience. Doesn't matter why, what the circumstances are, it is tragic and full of great sorrow. Something extremely difficult to overcome. In fact, there has been individuals who have lost a child and they're never the same. They never truly recover. They don't become whom they were prior 
to receiving that horrible news that your son, that your daughter is dead. And therefore, what we read here is of the utmost importance. And what God is revealing to us here is this. The events, even tragic, horrible experiences that we have, a death of a child, those horrible things do not change who God is. These things don't change how he behaves. And therefore, we ought not let these horrible experiences, happenings, occurrences, tragedies affect our perception of God. No matter what happens, God is God. And he's worthy of praise and thanksgiving. And in actuality, the real help in these difficult times are worship experiences. Because one of the teachings concerning the meaning of worship, that biblical word worship in the scripture, and there's a few, but, but one of the ideas of worship, biblically speaking, is drawing near to God. Through worship, we approach, we experience the presence of God. And in times when you've lost a child, you need to experience God. You need his presence in your life. Without that, I don't know how one goes forward. So we read once more to the chief musician concerning, in regard to, the death of a son, a psalm of David. Look now to verse 1 in English, verse 2 in, in Hebrew. What does David do? He says, I will give thanks. One word in Hebrew, I will give thanks. Now, normally you would expect Hashem to the Lord. But David is making a statement. I will give thanks, O Lord. What David is revealing to his God is that this experience doesn't change how he behaves in regard to God. Don't let your life experiences, tragedies as such we're speaking about in this passage or anything else, change your View your perception of God if that perception of God is rooted and founded in the Word of God. This book is truth. It reveals the character of God, the nature of God, the attributes of God, the reality of God, the personality of God. And if we form those things from Scripture, they ought never to be altered or changed. And that's what David is saying. He says, I give thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. And that is the very essence of his being. With every thought, with every mindset, nothing changes his perception, his thought. There is an inherent relationship between that word thought and heart. As a man thinketh in his heart. So David says, I give thanks. O oh Lord, with all my heart, and I will, and this is word for telling. Now, it's a unique word because it's also related to the same Hebrew word for counting. So David says, I'm going to count or recount. I'm going to tell all of your wonderful deeds. Now, this is important because David is grieving. He has lost a son, but nevertheless, he's not going to simply be consumed by that loss. He is going to begin to focus upon the wonderful things of God. Focusing, remembering, and sharing, giving testimony that what has happened in my life doesn't change the wondrous God, the marvelous God. Don't allow these things that cause us pain, misery, sorrow, exceedingly great grief 
don't let them change your perception of God. Focus upon the good deeds of God. Don't blame God for sin in this world or the consequences of sin. Be assured of something. God did not cause your son, your child to die. When you encounter bad things, God is not the source of them. You know what it is? Evil. And evil is related to sin. So much of what happens in our life that is uncomfortable, that is painful, that is grievous, that is full of sorrow, it is because sin in his, is in the world. So don't blame God for the creation of sin. Man chose sin. And with that, all of these horrible consequences entered into the world. He says, look now to the next verse. I will, and here's the word for, be glad. I will be glad and I will rejoice. And here's the key, in you. Now, when I look at, at this scripture, I see a progression. I see David first and foremost remembering, telling, recounting, numbering, taking an inventory of the good things that God has done. And it's when we do this that we are going to be brought into his presence. That's why he says here, I will rejoice, not about you, concerning you, but he says, in you. David is experiencing a great benefit, and that is being in a covenantal relationship with God. And he says, I will sing, and this is a word for singing in a praising manner. He says, I will sing, Shimcha Oyon, in your most high name. Now, this most high name, it's not the Yudhe Vav Hey, he simply uses the word Shem, name, your name, O God, but it's the word El Yom. And this is speaking about that which is the most high, the very best, that which is above all things. And what is the, the message for us? The message is seek God's character to be your character. When, when you become God-like, now we never become gods, little gods, that's heresy. But when we become God-like, things change. You see, God, and this is a very important thing, God needs nothing. God requires nothing personally for himself. God never lacks. God doesn't have too much, not enough. God is perfect always. In fact, there was never a time when God was not perfect. So he never calls you to do something for his benefit. He calls us, commands us to do things for our benefit or the benefit of others. And learn a principle. When you benefit someone else, you are going to find satisfaction and joy in that. So David is emphasizing this character of God, how it is this exalted name of God, his character, which is above all things. We want that to be our character. Verse, verse 4 in Hebrew, 3 in English. Now, we have enemies, and it's when we have the right perception of God. See, oftentimes God allows, did not say cause, but God allows us to go through difficult circumstances to experience the, the enmity that is in this world and the enemies that are in this world for a reason. We need to understand that he's greater than these enemies and therefore God, notice verse 4, 3 in English, when the return, and this is turning away, Turn away my enemies backwards. He's speaking about here how God, and only God can do this. Notice enemies. 
And the idea here is an opponent that is greater and more numerous than you. And the only thing that will cause them to retreat is God. If you try to fight your own battles and attempt to do so in flesh and blood, you will be the most miserable individual. I mean that. You will have grief in an exceedingly great manner. Stop fighting in the flesh. Stop warring in the physical. Realize what God is saying here. He is the only one that can cause your enemies to turn back to go backwards. And speaking about these enemies, he says they will, and it's a word for stumble. It's a word for falling in defeat. They will be defeated and they will perish from before you. Now, the you here, if we read it carefully, it is God. It is before God, not before us. We simply become a recipient of God's enemy's defeat. They are defeated before him, and therefore we reap, we share in that joy and the benefits of the enemies being defeated. Verse, verse 4. For you have done, we need to realize this. This enemy, and we can talk about the chief enemy, Hasatan, Satan, he has been defeated. When was he defeated? On the cross. And therefore, we need to realize that that judgment has already been pronounced. It has already been achieved. We're simply waiting for the effects thereof. But Satan is judged, condemned, defeated. He knows it but he doesn't want to succumb to it until he has to. He has no repentant attitude within him whatsoever, but he's defeated. So David is speaking and he says, you have done my judgment and my, and it's simply another synonym for judge. In Hebrew, we have the word uh, uh, dayan for a judge. And the word shofet, these are different words from those same two words, but different forms which speak of judgment. So God has already brought about judgment, the, the verdict. He has the power to achieve it, and we're just waiting for the result thereof. And that's why he says, move on. God, you have said he's already taken his seat upon the throne and he is shofet sedek he is a righteous judge now we know he is the righteous judge but it's simply describing him he is a righteous judge and that's why as we talked about earlier last week that we should be people who seek righteousness that's our perception that's what we are passionate for that's what we are pursuing that's what motivates us, righteousness. And when that's true, we will find that righteous judge, the righteous judge, that he is on the throne, and he at the right time, in the right way, in the right means, he will bring about the outcome of judgment. Verse, verse 6 in Hebrew, 5 in English, still speaking about God, and this is what's so important. I have mentioned to you, that, that the Psalms are books of praises. They are foundational in worship. And we know traditionally that there are, within the book of Psalms, five uh, uh, smaller books. So that's why we talk about the books of Psalms from a, a Jewish perspective. Most of the time in Christianity, just the book of Psalms, and that's fine. But what he's revealing here is this this is the book of psalms teaches us about worship and do you see how god focus the book of psalms is how we're always focusing upon god what he has done what he will do what is his will 
And all the praise and adoration and thanksgiving and worship is to him. He's the focus. And that's why it is very dangerous spiritually when worship is not God's focus, but it's on man. And it's done for man's pleasure. No, worship is for the pleasure of God. That we ascribe to him thanksgiving, praises, worship. And so frequently today, those principles are, are violated. So David is speaking, and notice what he says. You rebuke the nations. Now, in this context, the nations refer to those who have no covenant relationship, a non-covenant people. And he says, you rebuke the nations, and you, and the idea here is cause the wicked to perish. This word for perish is a word for destruction. God, through his judgment, he will bring about the destruction of the wicked. And all of this is in the past tense because even though the effects of it has not been manifested, they stand condemned and defeated and judged. We're just waiting for the judgment to be made manifest. Second part of, of verse 6, 5 in English. Their name you have, have erased, you wiped away, Leolam Ba'ed, forever and unto. Now, it's simply a way of saying forever and ever and ever and ever. Their name. And name can be synonymous in certain passages with their memory. There is going to be no memory of the wicked, the evil, those who have no covenantal connection with God. They're not going to be thought of. They're not going to be known, remembered. They are simply going to evaporate into eternity. But we are going to endure. Eternity, and when we speak of eternity, I'm speaking about the kingdom. With the establishment of the kingdom, which is forever an eternal kingdom, this is our finest hour that continues and continues and continues. That's why God is, is so good. So he says their name will be a race forever. The enemy, and it's uh, here in the singular, but it has all enemies is the implication. It says they, and this is the word tamu. What does that mean? They will come to the end. And their end, as I said, is eternal, but their end is coming when there'll be no more. And they're going to have haravot lenetza, eternal destruction. That's why it's not done and finished. But their destruction, their judgment is eternal. It's ongoing. We won't remember that but they are going to experience eternal destruction. And their cities, now in this world, the book of Revelation speaks to this, their cities will be uprooted, and it says their memory will also perish or be destroyed. And memory, this word, zacher, is an important word in the noun zachar, about the zecher, what's important about it is that it is a covenantal word. We've seen, and I've mentioned this many times to you, when God remembers, we see a covenantal commitment. And because there's going to be no memory because they have no covenantal relationship with God. So the enemy they are going to come to eternal destruction. That's their end. Their cities are going to be uprooted and their memory is going to perish. Verse, verse 8 in Hebrew, 7 in English. And the Lord forever, he will sit. Now, some Bibles will say abide. Well, that's fine. But it's a reference to the last time we saw that word, lashevet. Here it's the word yeshev. 
the last time we saw it was him sitting upon the throne. And God's judgment will never be unseated. He'll never be replaced. So forever, O Lord, he's saying, he will sit. For he has prepared, and this is this ongoing preparation, he has prepared, and this preparation will, will have an eternal outcome for his judgment. He has prepared his throne for judgment. And it's constant. It's abiding. It's now, tomorrow, and forevermore. Verse, verse 9, verse 8 in English. And he will judge, and it's word tevil, the world. And this means all of his creation. He will judge the world in righteousness. And that's why we need to understand righteousness and we need to live righteously. And it's only through the word of God, that revelation, that truth, and through the power, the anointing, the, the provision of the Holy Spirit in our life and what he brings. It's only then that we can live righteously. And we are called to live righteously. Last night, I was listening to a, a very unbiblical message. And the teacher, he gave an example. Now, this person always, I mean, he never loses or misses an opportunity to say something bad about, about our faith, about the church. And he does that because he wants people to, to love him, to come to his church and not someone else because his church is different. It's better. It doesn't have all that negativity. Well, the problem is this, and I've listened to him for several years, and it's true. He never has a negative message. He never speaks about conviction. He never speaks about true repentance. He never speaks about and identifies what sin is. And he never speaks about the need to enter into a covenantal relationship with God. All of it, you know, he says, if you're not a Christian, that's fine. No, it's not fine. You need to be a believer. You need to enter into that new covenant. And even though he'll use the term gospel, he never clearly says how you take hold of that gospel. And the reason why I'm saying that is this. He was giving an example about someone that he knew. And he says, you know, this person would would be in the house of God. And he would look at people and he would say, you know, they're, they're, they're so righteous. They speak about righteousness. They speak about getting against sin. And, and he said, you know, all this is fine and, and, and true. But his friend was saying, I could never be that. I, I could never be one of those people. And he was standing kind of on the outside in the back of the building. And he says he just kept going and never wanted to come back. What a tragic misrepresentation. God is righteous and he wants us to be righteous. And it's through, through a relationship with him, a new covenant re relationship that we will strive and become righteous. One who is in Messiah, he becomes righteous. Don't lessen the standards. We need to embrace them. And therefore, calling out sin, saying this is wrong, that this is evil, it's not turning people away, it's embracing them. It's a call to them to come into the light, come into righteousness. And that's why we see here, look at what the scripture is saying. Verse, verse 9, verse 8 in English. For he will judge the world in righteousness. And he will judge, is that other word for judging, but there's really no other way to translate it. He will judge the nations with uprightness. And therefore, we can't compromise what the scripture says is upright, what the scripture says is righteous. And therefore, we have to point out what is not upright and what is unrighteous. That's what the word of God does. And how do we have the perception to know this? 
through the commandments in this same teacher. He wants to unhitch the message of the gospel from the commandments of the Bible. He said, you know, no one wants to hear about these commandments. No one wants to, to be given these heavy requirements. They're God's requirement. There is God's truth. And it's the same God who says, my, my yoke is, is light. My burden is easy. Because when we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, these commandments become what we're passionate about. We aren't someone never want to hear them, talk about them, because these rules are rules that bring about joy and gladness. They equip us, they teach us about the expectations of God so we can carry them out through His power, His Holy Spirit in us. Holiness is good. So He says in this passage, that he is going to judge, look at it very carefully, he is going to judge the nations with uprightness. And it will come about that the Lord, that he, and it's word here, misgav, it's word for being lifted up, a place lifted up, out of reach of the enemy. And he says here, that the Lord's going to do that. He's going to be a refuge. He's going to place a refuge is that which is out of the, the reach of the enemy. And he's going to do that for the one who has been crushed, the one who's been pounded down. He's going to lift. And that's the idea. One who has been pounded down, God's going to lift him up and place us in that, that refuge that's, that's out of reach of the enemy. He uses that same word, misgav. It says, he will be an exalted place, a refuge in times of trouble. And notice not in a time of trouble, but times is in the plural, in times of trouble. They will trust in you. Who will? Those who know your name. And I would circle this, those who know the name. See, here's the problem. If you are not teaching what is right, what is good, what is proper, the standards of God, and therefore to teach the standards of God, you also have to teach what is sin. And this is what's lacking today. People think, and they may be right for this, in order to fill a large, and they don't call it a sanctuary, they prefer the term auditorium. In order to fill a large auditorium, a stadium, you have to not talk about sin. Well, I'd rather talk to two people truthfully, speaking and teaching the standards of God than teach a, a, a stadium of people who are going to live an unrighteous life and not really understand the character of God. That's why it says, pay attention to these words. The ones who trust in you, and this word for trust involves security. Those who have security, safety in you, they know your name. Name is character. They know the character of God. For you here again, always speaking, David's always speaking personally to God. For you will not leave. You have not left or abandoned the ones who seek you, O Lord. So you have to seek God by name. And you can only seek God by name if you know his character. If we don't know the standards of God, then we're going to be misled. Let me give you an example of this. There are those who wrongly teach that the Islamic uh, idol called Allah is the same God, the God of Israel, the God of Scripture. That is ridiculous. Even Islam knows that's a false teaching. It's sad that too much of Orthodox Judaism and Christianity has been deceived. Now, now Allah and Hashem, are not the same. And we know that because if you examine the character, the standards, the objectives of Allah, you find that they have nothing whatsoever, absolutely no connection with the 
biblical God, the God of Scripture, the God of Israel. And therefore, if you don't know God's standards, and where do you know God's standards? From his law, from his commandments. So if you don't know the standards of God, you won't know the character of God. And therefore, if you don't know the character of God, you will be misled into believing a name of God that is not God's name. And therefore, because of that, you have no hope. And therefore, you can't seek, seek him. He says, for God, you have not abandoned the ones who seek you, O Lord. And it's not the word Elohim. It is not any other name of God. It is that sacred name of God, yud heh which speaks about the uniqueness, the transcendent God. Now look at verse 12, verse 11 in English. Saying to the Lord, saying to who? The one who sits in Zion, in Zion. Now I guarantee you something. You will not find in the, the Quran, you will not find in any other religion a statement about the God who sits in Zion. We know that Zion is a kingdom word, but but they don't love Zion. They want to dominate and change the name of Zion. They don't use that term because Zion speaks about the excellency of Jerusalem. You know, this same individual that I was referring to, I've noticed something. As I said, I've been listening to him for quite some time. And I've seen how he has gone from using the term Israel to now choosing the term Palestine. He's confused on vocabulary because he's confused in the nature of God. See, we need to be people who rely upon the scriptural terminology. Zion, what a wonderful term, Jerusalem. And not too long ago, a, a good friend uh, to a couple friends of uh, Rivka and myself, they asked me to, to watch a, a video, which we did because they're good friends. And uh, in that, I noticed something. Those who were saying, you know, the temple is really not where the temple is on, on Mount Zion, but it's down below in the city of David. Now, that is a false teaching. And I thought it was so interesting that those who were teaching that falsehood, instead of speaking about the Temple Mount, they were using an Islamic term, very significant, an Islamic term to speak about the Temple Mount. And why was that? Because they were being confused and deceived by the falsehood of the Islamic religion, believing that Allah and Yehovah, the God of Israel, are one and the same. They are not. They did not know the nature of God, the name of God, and therefore they could not seek God properly. So he says here, again, verse 12 in, in Hebrew, 11 in English, saying unto the Lord, the one who dwells in Zion, and declare among the people his deeds, what he has done. And that's why if you want to unhitch the Old Testament from the New, you are a false teacher. Because it is through the Old Testament that we see so many wonderful, marvelous things that God has done. And we learn greatly about his character, his nature. And through that, we can understand his expectations. Many of God's deeds manifest his fidelity to his commandments, meaning this. If God were to become a man, and he did, he would keep the commandments, which Yeshua, Jesus, did. And we see that fidelity in the Old Testament and how God behaved, what he did, his works. That's why it tells us, declare among the peoples, these would be the non-Jewish people, his deeds. Verse 13, 
12 in English. Four. Now, this is the word Doresh. Doresh is a strong seeking. I've mentioned this in some of my other teachings recently. And it's so significant that we see when words are reported, repeated, when words are repeated in the biblical text, there's a reason. Sometimes, frequently, it's emphasis. But here, we talked about earlier on at the end of, and I'll say the English verse, verse 11, how it talks about that God will not forsake, he will not leave, he will not abandon those who seek him. And now it speaks about God seeking something. And what does God seek? Well, it's the word in Hebrew for blood in the plural, damim. And it's simply a term that speaks about judgment. It speaks about life. God will seek their judgment. He will take their life. He is going to act in their blood, meaning shedding their blood, bringing them to death. That's the biblical God. And he does so, keep reading. And he will not, though, forget the cry of the, and there's a disagreement whether the word should be those who are afflicted, the afflicted ones or the humble ones. Now, there is great similarity between the word anayim and the word anavim. So he says that he will not forget, that means he will remember, he will not forget the cries of the either impoverished ones or the humble ones. Verse, verse 13, 14 in Hebrew. Be gracious unto me, O Lord, and and see the the see my afflictions or my poverty and my enemies look upon them and lift me up he uses the word me robe me lift me up from the gates of death so david is plying here ple pleading and petitioning god for life not to let the enemies and his affliction caused him to go into the gates of death, the gates of Sheol. Verse, verse 15. On account, if David finds God's deliverance, what's he going to do? He says, on account or for the sake of that I will make mention, that I will recount, that I will tell all of your praise. And in the gates of, and this is the second time Zion is mentioned, Zion, in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I will rejoice in your salvation. Notice there's a, a connection between Zion and salvation. Salvation needs to, and I share this often, needs to be related to victory. And the place of victory, Zion, Zion, as I mentioned, Zion is a kingdom word. So David doesn't want to descend into the gates of death. He wants to experience to be lifted up into the kingdom of victory. In regard to the goyim, and this means here, those individuals that have no covenantal relationship, and I believe we're speaking about a new covenantal relationship with God. Those who do not have a new covenantal relationship with God, they are going to be sunken down. They are going to sink. It's a word for drown. They're going to drown in the pit that they have made. Meaning their own actions, their own lifestyles, their own actions are going to bring about their own defeat. And in this net, it says that they have hidden, their legs are going to be taken or captured. So they are going to find that it's their actions, their deeds, their plans, their objectives that is going to bring about their own defeat. Verse 17 in Hebrew, 16 in English. Make known, O Lord, the judgment that, that he has done. So God will make known the judgment that he has done and in the, the work the activity of his hands, this is the word for palms literally, he says that, that 
it will become a snare for the wicked. So, so God is going to act. He's going to bring judgment. And he is going to lay a snare for the wicked ones. And then notice how verse 17, that is verse 16 in English, ends. It's a word, higayon sela. Now, higayon is logic. When we have the right perception of God, we are going to see things logically, but it's a kingdom logic. We're going to have a heavenly perspective. All of this is going to make sense to us, but it begins with what? It begins with seeing God properly. Verse 18 in Hebrew, 17 in English. The wicked ones, they are going to return to Sheol. That is, they're going to return to be pushed into. They are going to change direction. They're not going to achieve what they want. They're going to return to the place of death. And every individual, all the nations that have no covenantal relationship with God, it says these are the ones, these non-covenant people, they're the ones who have forgotten God. And here we have a change instead of what we've seen over and over that yud heh vav -Hey, those four letters referring to the Lord Almighty. We have here the term Elohim, which speaks about, and I hope you know this by now, the God who judges. So they have forgotten that God judges. They were so consumed with their own objectives, their own purposes, their own wants. They lived life according to their standards, what seemed right in their eyes. And because of that, they are going to experience. They've forgotten that God is a God of judgment. Verse 19 in Hebrew, 18 in English. For not forever will he forgive, forget the, the poor. This is the word evyon, someone who is destitute, totally poor and impoverished. Now, it may seem temporarily in this world of corruption and injustice and sin, that God forgets those who are impoverished. Kind of the poor in spirit, but this can be poor physically as well. It may seem that God has forgotten, but he will not forgive them or forget them forever. He will remember them, and notice what it says. And the hope of, and this is the same word for the humble ones or the afflicted ones, the hope, their hope, and we have to bring that, that negative from the first part of the sentence, that God will not uh, uh, forget their hope. Their hope will not perish forever. It may seem that way that it's destroyed that which they hoped for, but God can resurrect it. Verse, verse 20 in Hebrew, 19 in English. Rise up, O Lord, and, and not, not let there be human power. That's what he says here. He says he will not act and be powerful with human power. That's not what's going to help us. All the power of humanity will not solve our spiritual problem. Only a supernatural God can do that. And God is going to rise up. And he is going to judge the nations before you will. He will judge the nations before him. Now it's before you. He will judge before himself. All of these nations, all of these that have no covenantal relationship. Now the last verse, last verse in Hebrew, obviously last verse in English as well. He says, O Lord, put, place, establish. Give, in other words, set to these individuals fear. So place, O Lord, fear upon them that the nation should know, that the nation should know that they are what? That they're only human. God is God. And it makes no sense. What David is referring to is this. It makes no sense for us, mere human beings, to argue, to disagree, to rebel, to try to thwart, or to be uninterested in the things of God. 
See, this is my perception concerning Scripture and sharing from the Scripture. I never say to myself, what do people want to hear? Or even, what do they need to hear? I'm in no position. I'm a man. I'm in no position to answer those questions, to come up with a strategy, a, a gimmick, something that the people will be thinking sensational. I can't do that. I don't attempt it. I believe because this is the word of God and not me. That, that what people really need is to know this. Not to say, well, this is not for today. This is not going to be pleasing. People aren't going to want to hear that. They're not going to come. Those thoughts never enter into my mind. The only thing that, that I'm committed to is sharing this supernatural word of God and believing that when that supernatural word is, is spoken, when we read the text and we help understand the meaning of the text, that the Holy Spirit will be present. He will go to work and he will give change. He will give a different perception to people. Not what I think, what I cognitively have concluded, but what God knows is truth. See, as a man, we can be easily deceived. It's only when we do not lean upon our own understanding, our own methodology, our own thoughts. It's only when we lean not on our own understanding, but we lean upon the truth of God that we can be assured that good things, godly things, are going to happen. And that is the purpose that we have began this study of the book of Psalms. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.